For longer, dialogue-free sounds for sleep, please consider subscribing to Sleep Tight Premium. Visit sleeptightpremium.com to start a free trial. Thank you. Hello, I'm Cheryl, and this is Sleep Tight Relax, a calming bedtime podcast for the young and young at heart. It's time to get cozy in bed and listen to tonight's story. Our sleep story is about snowballs. Our story begins with a snowball fight, and then the boys decide to make some snowballs for the next day's fight. That night, when the boys are sleeping, a storm comes and covers up all the snowballs, and they are forgotten until spring, when the snow is melting. When the snowballs hear someone calling to them, they want to know who it is. But when that voice asks for help, they all have a reason not to help, except for snowball number one. But before we continue with our story, let's take a moment to relax. We can practice our deep breathing anytime or anywhere. But before bed, Let's first turn down the lights, get comfortable, and make sure that everything feels as it should. Now close your eyes if you'd like, and we'll begin with a few slow, deep belly breaths. Each time you breathe in, breathe all the way down into your belly. When you breathe in, be sure to slowly breathe through your nose. And when you breathe out, try to push all the air out of your lungs. Breathe in. And breathe out. Notice how you feel when you take these deep breaths. How you get more and more relaxed with each breath. How the weight of your body sinks into the bed. Breathe in. And breathe out. Throughout this time of relaxation and our story... Thoughts of the day or the day to come may enter your mind. That's okay and normal. When they come, just try to return your attention to your breathing, to the story and music. Breathe in. And breathe out. Perfect. Let's continue with the snowball that didn't melt. Biff, flick, swat, smack. Biff, biff, flick, flick, swat, swat, smack, smack. It was a fine day in midwinter. The sun was just warm and bright enough to make the snow pack easily. The boys in the neighborhood were having the liveliest kind of snowball fight. So that is why there was this. Biff, flick, swat, smack. And this. Biff, biff, flick, flick, swat, swat, smack, smack. But everything ends sometime. So this snowball fight did. One side or the other one, I have forgotten which. 
The boys at the little brown shingled house where the fight took place became very busy making snowballs for the next day's battle. You could hear the pat, 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 pat as they rounded and packed their snowballs in their cold red hands. When they became quite satisfied that they had enough on hand for the lively battle, they piled the snowballs up in a neat pyramid just under the edge of the veranda and went off to look for something new to do. Then the snowballs fell to talking, if it is true that snowballs talk. I wonder what they are going to do with us, said the top one. I know what I'd like to do. I'd like to hit the nose of that rough, freckled-faced boy who hit the nose of the boy who made me. I know what I'd like, said the second. I'd like to go right through the window of old Grampy's house. Wouldn't he spot her? Oh, what's the fun in teasing a poor old man, said another. I'll tell you what I'd like. I'd like to hit the man right in the middle of the back and see what he'd do. Hit the man in the back, said a lively-looking chap down in the middle of a pile. Be a sport. I'd like to knock the policeman's hat off and see him chase the boy that threw me. That would be fun. It was, you see, a very naughty and mischievous lot of snowballs, if one may judge from their big talk. And so it was probably good for the peace of the neighborhood that that evening had scarcely fallen when through a sudden change in the weather, snow too began to fall. All night long the snow fell, thicker and faster, thicker and faster. The wind rose and piled it in stacks. The house was banked to the windows. The veranda was heaped up high. The snowballs were buried deep, so deep that the boys forgot them. It was spring before the thick covering of snow was melted enough so that they could see the light of day. It was a long time after this when there came a day which meant much for at least one of that heap of snowballs. The sun was bright and hot. The grass was beginning to show green. The snow had all gone except in a few places on the cold side of the houses and under veranda edges. The snowballs were still piled neatly in the pyramid, but they looked as if they might tumble down almost any minute. Although it was cool in their shady spot, every one of them was sweating, and several of them looked thin and pale. I think they had felt the heat, for all their lives they had been accustomed to a cooler climate. As they were busy mopping their brows and sighing for cooler weather, they heard a sound, between a sigh and a faint moan. They heard it again and again. It was above their heads, out on the lawn, and not far away. It seemed to be in or around a shrub or bush, with a tall, slender stem and a branching top. What's that? asked several of the balls at once. They stopped talking and sighing and listened. And as they did so, they could hear words very distinctly, though they were not nearly as loud as a whisper. Snowball, snowball, come up here. My head is hot, my throat feels queer. I'm going to faint, I surely fear. Won't some cool snowball come up here? Who are you? asked snowball number one, who sat at the tip top of the pile. 
Where are you? And what is your name? I'm life of the bush. In the bush I dwell. I know not my name, and so I can't tell. I can't see you, said number one, as he looked intently up at the branches. You can't, said the bush, then you must be blind. I'm right up here, but never mind. The voice trailed off weakly. Then they heard it again. I'm going to faint, I really fear. Won't some kind snowball come up here? But you are up so high, how can one get there? We have neither a ladder nor wings, and we do not know how to climb. Number one did most of the talking, as he was nearest the bush. I'll tell you how, said Life of the Bush, stopping his rhyme and talking plainly and simply and sensibly. Just roll down the slope on the lawn to the foot of this bush. Make yourself as small as small can be. Creep down into the ground and take an elevator, which is always running, and you will come directly up to me. The talking ceased and the snowballs began to look at each other rather uneasily. I can't go, said number two, who was in the second row from the top. I always tan terribly in the sun. It's a long way down to the foot of the bush, and I should be as tanned as a berry before I get halfway. I can't go either, said number three by his side, I don't tan, but I freckle, and freckles look dreadful on my fair complexion. I'm sorry I can't go, said number four from his place in the corner of the third row. But I feel the heat terribly. My clothes are all sticking to me now. It's simply out of the question for me, said a big fat snowball down near the ground. I know I'd melt before I got there. There isn't much left of me now. Number one was one of the fairest snowballs of the bunch, but he was not afraid of freckles or tan. He was also one of the smartest of the lot. He looked down to the foot of the bush. It seemed a long way, and the sun was certainly burning hot. He was not at all sure that he would live long enough in that sun to reach the bush. But someone should keep life of the bush from fainting, and he would try. He turned a quick somersault off the pile down to the ground. And just that moment, something disturbed the whole pile, and every ball in it tumbled down and out into the sun. As soon as number one touched the ground, he began to roll over and over and over, as fast as ever he could. It didn't take him more than a minute to reach the foot of the bush. He remembered what life of the bush had said, made himself just as small as small could be, crept down into the ground close to the stem and took the elevator, which seemed to be running all the time. It took quite a while to go up, but finally the elevator paused just long enough for him to get out. He found himself in a cool, rambling house that seemed to be almost all long, narrow halls. They ran this way and that way, and every which way. At one end of each hall, where the buds were opening, there were windows with green shades. Everything was very clean and sweet. Right in the middle of the house, he found life of the bush. He gave her a drink of water, which he had carried in his waterproof pocket and not only kept her from fainting, 
but made her as lively and well and happy as ever. Life of the Bush thanked the snowball a thousand times and gave him the freedom of her beautiful house. Now that you are here, she said, perhaps you will stay a while and help me build my house a little bigger. I must build leaves and buds and branches and bark. I need your help. The snowball stayed and helped. He found it very exciting work. He worked all day and all night, ran here and there, and never stopped for meals. He packed buds and unfolded them. He pushed out the leaves and built out the end of branches. He made bark, pressed it till it was hard and colored it gray. Day after day, he worked at his tasks as if they gave him the greatest joy in the world. But now and then, life of the bush saw him gazing out of the window as if he were a bit homesick to get out of doors again. Stay with me a little longer, she said, to help me build my blossoms. And then I will send you out of doors on a beautiful errand to stay as long as your heart desires. So Snowball stayed and helped Life of the Bush build her blossoms. Basket after basket of white stuff as white as snowflakes, but ever so much smaller. He carried out to the ends of the branches. Jar after jar of perfume he carried too, until the blossoms were quite complete. Then one evening, it was the last of May or early June, life of the bush called him. Tomorrow, she said, there is to be a great garden festival. A prize is to be given for the most original and beautiful blossom. All the flowers of the season will be here in the garden. You have been a good friend and a faithful helper. For reward, you may go to the festival and stay as long as your heart desires. But how shall I go? asked the snowball. Right out through the end of one of my branches, said Life of the Bush. But I will fall off, said the snowball. I'll tie you on with a stout string so that not even the wind can blow you off. But it's hot outside. I will melt. Oh, no. I've changed you so the hottest sun cannot melt you. But how can I get out through the end of the branch? Asked the snowball, who could not get it through his head that he could really get out to the end of the branch and stay there all day and not fall off or melt. Make yourself very small, just as small as when you came up to me, and you can go out as easily as you run along these halls, said Life of the Bush. The snowball became quite excited. The festival was to begin very early in the morning. Besides, he wanted to see, if he could, what had become of the other snowballs. So he decided that he would go out on the branch that night while it was dark and be there for the whole day's fun. So he made himself very small, ran along the hall, crept out through a tiny green door and found himself tied securely to a swaying branch. The air was cool and sweet. He didn't melt as he half feared he might, and he didn't fall off. He looked around. Yes, this was the very bush he had seen before, but it was greener now. Morning came and the great festival. The garden was full of flowers and folks. 
There were lilacs and lilies of shades manifold. There were daisies and daffodils, yellow as gold. There were pansies and peonies, red, white, and pink. And every such flower of which you can think. You ought to have heard the ahs and the ohs, and all the fine people in all their fine clothes. You ought to have seen that wonderful sight, for no rhyme of mine can describe it half right. People went from bush to bush and from flower to flower. They could not for the life of them tell which blossom they thought most beautiful and original. The judges wandered about uncertainly with the ribbons in their pockets, not knowing to what plant or bush to tie them. The snowball grew very much interested, not to say excited, to see what blossom would finally win the prize. He noticed that groups of people continually stopped before the bush on which he hung. Apparently, they admired it. He soon discovered that they were looking at him and was quite embarrassed. Look, he kept hearing them say, see this snowball? And it doesn't melt. Why, it's growing on the bush. It's a blossom. That was the first that he knew that life of the bush had changed him from a snowball into a flower snowball. Of course, he became very happy and twice as excited. Indeed, he could hardly breathe from excitement when the judges came over in a group to where he grew. They looked at him and at the bush. Apparently, they had never seen blossoms of this kind before. I never saw such a big, round, white blossom before, he heard one of them say, as he drew a blue ribbon from his pocket and tied it to the stem on which he hung. He knew, and soon, of course, everybody knew, that the snowball bush had won the prize. His heart beat so fast that he thought he was growing red in the face. Perhaps he was melting. But he wasn't, for he heard a girl say just then as she passed, how white and cool it looks. Snowball number one had often wondered what happened to his friends, the other snowballs. One reason why he had been anxious to get out of the bush was to find out, if he could, what had become of them all. But the doings of the day had driven all thoughts of them out of his busy head. Now, as the people began to leave the garden and excitement grew less, he remembered and looked around. Here was the yard in which the boys made him. There was the very place, under the edge of the veranda, where he had spent the winter and where they had all stood that spring morning when life of the bush called to them. There was the place, almost under him, where he knew they had all tumbled down the moment he had left them. But not a trace of a snowball could be seen. Of course not. They had all disappeared long ago, the very day, indeed, in which they had tumbled down. Before noon, the hot sun had melted them, every one, and carried them away, tan and freckles and all, and no one ever heard of them again. Number one, who ran right out into the sun, was the only snowball that didn't melt. And that's the end of our story. Sleep tight.